Good morning again, church. I'm looking forward to a new series that will happen for three Sabbaths, beginning today. And our study is in the book of John. Uh, Can we transition to the Apple TV back there? And we'll get our slides up for you. And... The the book of John, it's one of the four Gospels, one of the four accounts of the life of Jesus, and we're going to do this in three parts, which obviously means we're not going to study it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but I would like to give you a big picture of the book of John and give you an idea of what it's about, why John wrote this book, and some of the insights for our walk with Jesus. So... Let me start. Um, Are we going to be a couple minutes? Okay, while they're getting the slides ready, I'm going to tell you about another ministry opportunity, opportunity to come together and connect with people and build relationships. Um, This week, we sent out in our e-newsletter that there's going to be, in addition to basketball on Monday nights for men at Hoodview Adventist Academy, which is our Adventist school, here in the community. John, is it Tuesdays or Thursday nights? Tuesday nights, there is going to be co-ed volleyball. So I see some of our basketball uh, friends. Dan plays on Monday night, and I see Ross, you're here today, and Ross is, and of course, Nathan and uh, Aaron. So we've been coming together, and it's an opportunity to build community with uh, young people, Uh, outside of church, and now there's going to be volleyball night. So if anyone enjoys playing volleyball, young or old, um, it's going to be for men and women, and Hoodview is opening the gym for volleyball. So you are invited to that. And uh, should I just preach without the slides today? Oh, I'm not connected. That's me. Okay. I might have disconnected myself during prayer. Well, that would explain it. Let's see here. Uh, It shows that I'm connected to the Apple TV, so, okay, well, in that case, we'll go without slides today. Got to be ready with or without technology, so let's do this. I want to tell you a story, I won't have pictures, but I'll tell you a story about 20 years ago, actually exactly 20 years ago today. I was in the country of Honduras in a little island which is part of the country of Honduras called Roatan. Roatan is an English-speaking island in a Spanish-speaking country. One of the most beautiful places in the world that you would ever visit. Anyone here, just curious, ever been to Roatan? Anyone ever been to Hon- You've been to Roatan. Nice. Okay. So I have one witness in the house that will be able to uh, agree with what I'm about to say, I think. Um, I was in Honduras helping to build a Christian school in the capital, Tegucigalpa. And I was with a ministry called Maranatha, which does uh, building projects all around the world. And usually at the end of the mission trip... There's usually two or three days for recreation, and on this particular trip, they organized two or three days in a little island off of uh, the country of Honduras, but part of the country of Honduras called Roatan, and it's one of those places where the sand is white, and the water is turquoise, and the beaches are beautiful, and the food is great, and the people are friendly, and it was just one of those experiences where you say, one day I have to come back, and it's been 20 years and I haven't been back. But I'm telling you today that Roatan is a place worth visiting. Now, many of you only know me for six months, and so trust is something that grows when a relationship is built over a period of time. So if I tell you this morning that Roatan is a beautiful place, Tim, do you agree with that? You agree with it. You've been there. 
but the rest of us this morning have never been to Roatan. And so if I tell you Roatan is a beautiful place, you should go see it. You may believe that Roatan is a beautiful place. You may agree with me because maybe you've learned to trust me to some degree, and so you have accepted, at least in your intellect, this idea that Roatan is a great place. Today, as we study the book of John, I want you to notice the difference between knowing and believing. Because it is one thing for you to believe, based on my witness, based on my testimony to you, that Roatan is a great place, a place worth visiting, a beautiful part of the world that you should get to know one day. You can believe it based on my witness, based on my testimony, because I was there and you may have a certain level of trust in me. But there is only one way to know that Roatan is great. And how is it that you can know it? What is, what is it that causes you to know it? What do you have to do? You have to experience Roatan. And so there is a difference between believing and knowing. By the way, one more illustration. Mangoes. Some of you have never perhaps tasted a really good mango because Walmart and Costco and Sam's Club, it's hit or miss. But if you've tasted a great mango, Kevin, I see you nodding your head, you've traveled and you've tasted a great mango, you become an advocate of the fruit called mango. You love mangoes and you tell other people about it. And if I'm telling you that mangoes are great and you've never tasted a mango, you might believe me because you've trusted me, because we're friends, we have a relationship. So you believe mangoes are good. But how is it that you can know that mangoes are good? You have to taste it, or as someone said, experience it. With that in mind, I'm inviting you to turn in your Bibles to the last chapter in the book of John, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And we are going to study the book of John. And we've all agreed, I believe so far, that there is a difference between believing and knowing. Well, John is the only of the four Gospels that actually declares in the book why he wrote this book. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all wrote about the life of Jesus, and they all highlighted different stories, and they had different audiences and different purposes for writing their book, and we don't know explicitly why why did Matthew write his book who was he writing to and why did he leave out some stories and include others and Mark Luke same thing so we speculate maybe Matthew wrote to convince the Jews that Jesus was really the Messiah with Matthew Mark and Luke we kind of guess why they wrote their books with John we don't have to guess because he states it explicitly in the book. And so we are in John chapter 21, and in verse 24, now you're going to have to open your Bibles this morning and go with me to several passages because the slides are not up. But in John chapter 21, verse 24, the Bible says, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. This is... Uh, speaking about John, one of the twelve that followed Jesus for three and a half years, and who has written these things. And whoever is writing this appendix to the book, because this is actually not John writing verse 24. John writes the book, and then somebody adds a little note at the end, kind of like the book of Deuteronomy, 
We all know Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, but the last few verses of Deuteronomy is talking about how Moses died, and this is what happened after he died. So we know that somebody must have written a few additional notes at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Well, the book of John is that way too. Somebody writes an additional note. Referring to John, if you read the previous verses, whoever is writing verse 24 says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. In other words, John is the one who wrote the book that we're reading. And the person that's writing verse 24 says, we know that his testimony is true. Now, it's interesting, John is writing to second generation followers of Jesus. He is writing to a group of people. We don't know where. It could have been Ephesus. It could have been another place. But he's writing, or it could have been many places, but he's writing to people who never saw Jesus, never walked with Jesus, never heard Jesus. He is writing to people who are relying on the testimony of those who did see and did witness Jesus. But these people are saying, we know that his testimony is true. We trust John, we believe the things he is saying, and we know that his witness, his testimony about Jesus is true. Go back one chapter to John chapter 20. We're going to see here, that John continues in his account and towards the end of the book, he tells us why he wrote the book. John chapter 20 and verse 30, John says this. As he's coming to the end of the book, John the Apostle writing the book of John says in John 20 verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. You all know that what we have about the life of Jesus is not an exhaustive account. It is a sample. John says that if we were to write everything that Jesus did, the whole world, he's probably exaggerating, but the whole world wouldn't be able to contain the volumes of books that would have to be uh, held in order to tell all the stories. He says, we've given you a sample. And then in verse 31, John is going to tell us why he wrote his book, why he told these stories to these second generation followers of Jesus who were not privileged to live in the time of Jesus, to see Jesus for themselves. John says in John 20, 31, but these, these stories are written, these chapters have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Now, that sounds kind of broad. Didn't all the gospel writers write so that people would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? Yes, but John is very specific in his writing this book. John, as far as we know, was the last of the twelve that stayed alive. He was the one that wrote the book of Revelation. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and he was uh, martyred for his faith. But before that, John had the opportunity to write. After all the other apostles had died, as the church was facing brutal persecution under uh, an emperor named Diocletian towards the end of the first century, and it seemed like the Christian faith was being suppressed like never before. And now he's the only apostle left, still alive, that actually saw, actually heard, and actually handled Jesus. And so John is writing because he wants this second generation of followers of Jesus to keep firm in their belief 
that Jesus is the Son of God. And prior to making this statement, we have a story in verses 24 to 29 that John tells us about one of the twelve named Thomas, who after the resurrection of Jesus was not with the other ten when Jesus appears in his resurrected form. And we have a word we usually attach to Thomas when we talk about this disciple. What's the word we use? What is he usually called? Doubting Thomas. The reason why we call Thomas Doubting Thomas is because of the story that we can read here in verses 24 to 29. Basically, Thomas says to the other 11, or 10 disciples, because Judas was out of the picture, so we're down to 10, in verse 25, the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. We've seen him. He is risen from the dead. But he said, and this is what Thomas said, we're reading in John 20, verse 25, John says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, Thomas says, I will never believe. Now, I want you to think about this. If all of us follow Thomas' example, we would all become non-believers. Are you following? Because none of us have had the opportunity to see, hear, and touch the living Christ. And I don't know about you, but the idea that a person who has died is capable of coming back to life sounds very strange and out of the ordinary way things usually happen in the world. Are you with me? It doesn't happen. It's unusual. It is, we could say, supernatural. And Thomas was being invited to believe in something that was on the surface crazy on the basis of the ten who saw it. And Thomas says, I will not believe unless I see for myself. And Jesus, in his mercy and his compassion, will actually condescend to Thomas and his unbelief and appear to him, and he'll say, Thomas, I want you to take your hand, I want you to put it right here on my side, and I want you to feel it. And we read here in John chapter 20, verse 27, where Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Then Jesus says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Did Thomas believe now? Yes, he did. But I want you to notice verse 29. And I want us to keep verse 29 tucked away. Jesus says this, Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Have you believed because you touched me? Have you believed because I actually came to you in bodily form? And then Jesus says, the punchline. I believe this is the punchline of the whole book. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you in the next couple of Sabbaths. The last part of verse 29. Jesus says to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Did you see that? Jesus tells Thomas, you have believed because you saw. And the apostles, they were sent as witnesses because they saw, they touched, they heard. But Jesus says that there is going to be a whole generation, a whole multitude of people who will believe without seeing. On what basis would they believe if they have not seen? 
they will believe on the basis of witnesses. But then we have a challenge. The witnesses who were alive to actually see, touch, and hear, they're dead. So on what basis do others believe when the testimony of the eyewitnesses are gone? Remember that step after believing? You believe, you are invited to believe, and then at some point there is a transition from believing to knowing. Well, the Bible tells us that knowing changes you. By knowing God, by knowing Jesus, on a personal level, you are changed. And in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, This is life eternal, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. My children believe everything we tell them because they're not teenagers yet. See, there's, a, there's a, a process that kids go through where it, in one phase, they'll believe anything daddy tells them. Even if I say that Santa Claus is real, they'll believe it, right? And then there is a phase in the child's life, I'm not there yet, but I've been there as a child and I've seen other children go through it where nothing dad says can be true. My my friends at school, what they say are true, but if but if dad says it, I'm skeptical of it. And those are usually the teenage years, right? But right now my children they believe everything we tell them. The reason why is because they trust us. They have evidence that we love them and they have evidence that we are trustworthy and so they believe. When it comes to Jesus and who he is, we tell our children this is who Jesus is and they believe. They believe that there is eternal life. They believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. But my goal is not for my children to merely believe as an intellectual exercise. I want them to know. Knowing is a new level of experience with God. And according to the Bible, when we know God... We are transformed. That transformation, according to Jesus, and we're going to unpack this in the book of John, that transformation is the evidence. Just like when Jesus said, look, touch my hands, feel my side, now do you believe? Well, we don't have the bodily resurrected Jesus to go around saying, please, trust me when I say Jesus is alive because here he is. We don't have that. What did God give us? Because he's given us this task to go around as witnesses to talk about a resurrected criminal. Because that's what uh, people who were crucified, they were criminals. We know Jesus was innocent, but we are called to proclaim a message about a resurrected man that lived 2,000 years ago from an obscure family in an obscure region of uh, Palestine called Galilee and say that he is alive. What has God given us in order to be able to demonstrate that our witness is trustworthy? The Holy Spirit. And last week, we heard a a witness come up to the front, John. And we're going to hear other witnesses. Next week, we're going to hear Dwayne. 
Dwayne is going to share. And as I hear some of your stories, and some are more dramatic than others, but it doesn't have to be dramatic. My story is not dramatic. But at the age of 17, I accepted someone's invitation to believe. But I believe just like you believe in Roatan and just the way some of you believe in mangoes. But when I accepted that person's invitation to believe in Jesus, as I walked through that door of belief and as I got to know Jesus, my life changed through the power of the Holy Spirit. My life transformed is my evidence to you. I can't give you a lecture to prove to you that Mary as a virgin got pregnant or that Jesus as a crucified Messiah was resurrected or that in six days God created heaven and earth. I cannot through reason and bullet points and rational scientific evidence demonstrate to you that these things are true. All I have is the Spirit who changed my life. And I can tell you that story. How a power outside of myself broke the chains of addiction and sin and gave me victory. And the same Spirit that gave me victory, I know is the Spirit that raised Jesus back to life. It's the same Spirit that conceived in Mary's womb a child, though she was a virgin. And it was the same Spirit that hovered over the waters on creation. Weak. The book of John is John inviting a second generation of believers to taste and see. If you read with me in the book of 1 John, this is the same John writing a a short letter, 1 John chapter 1, and we will end in just a moment and we'll continue next week. Here in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, The same John writing for the same purpose. His burden was that those who did not see or hear or touch would also believe. 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. John could say that, but those listening had to rely on his witness. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So John is saying, I know you haven't seen it, I know you haven't heard it, I know you haven't touched it, but I have, and I'm inviting you to join me and have fellowship with me because my fellowship is with Him. And so at what point then can they know for themselves if the resurrected Jesus is not going to be there? John writes here in chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, talking about the Spirit. He uses the word anointing, and we know that he's referring to the anointing of the Spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, the Bible says, the anointing that you received from Him abides in you. The evidence is in you if you open your heart to Him. And that you have no need that anyone should teach you. 
but as his anointing teaches you about everything. How do I know that God is real? How do I know that Jesus died and was risen again? The only way I can know is if the Spirit reveals it to me. I know it's in the Word. I know it's written here. But how do I know this is true? How do I know that this is reliable? It's because the Spirit that inspired this works in me. 1 John chapter 4 I'm sorry, chapter 5. Notice how John puts it here. 1 John chapter 5, it says in verse 10, we're going to start with verse 9 and read verse 10. This is it. We're ending here. If we receive the testimony of men, have we received the testimony of men? Yes, we have. We receive the testimony of Peter. We receive the testimony of John. We receive the testimony of Paul. We receive the testimony of Moses. And that is great. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Are you seeing this? Watch this. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. You, you want to know what it is? It's in verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony where? Where is the testimony? In himself. So you have the testimony of John, Peter, Paul, Luke, Matthew, Mark. You have the testimony. And they have given us a testimony of what they know because they experienced it and they've written it down and they're inviting us to believe. But how can you know? How can you know? The the witness, the evidence is in you. It's the anointing. It's the spirit. Our goal for children and young people is that they will know. You know, conversion does not happen automatically because you're born in a Christian home. Did you know that? But they will believe. They will believe. But there will come a time where they need to know. And if they don't know, by the time that they're ready to go to college, if they do go to college... There will be other influences and sources of truth in their lives. If they don't know and they just believe because you told them, soon you will be one of many sources in their lives. Are you following? But let me tell you this. When Daniel, at the age of 16, was swept from his home in Jerusalem and taken to Babylon... He didn't just believe in the God of Abraham. He knew the God of Abraham. Are you following? Because Daniel was now away from those early influences. He was there on his own, and there were new sources of truth in his life. But we read in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Nobody puts their lives on the line for someone that they don't know. Daniel knew. And my prayer is that our children will know. And you know how they're going to know? Because they're going to see Jesus in us. And you know what is the fastest path to disbelief among children and young people and young adults? Is when they Don't see Jesus in the ones who profess him. That's the fastest path to disbelief for a youth and young adult. Now, this is not a sermon about youth and young adult ministry. This is for all of us because we may be in the church as members for years, even decades, and we may be believers 
who have actually not experienced, at least not to the extent that God wants us to experience Him. Because by beholding, we become changed. And that change is not just outward compliance with rules that the church has, right? You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery. These are, and these are not the church's rules, these are God's rules. But Jesus taught something on the sermon on the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says our compliance is not keeping the law, it's in the heart. And let me tell you, the Spirit will work to the extent that we will let Him work. And I want to let him work in my life. I want my children to see Jesus in me. And I want everyone to see Jesus in me. And I believe that is your desire too. Or you wouldn't be here this morning. If that is your desire, if you want that anointing from the Spirit, if you want that transformation, if you want to know him afresh, because maybe you've known him, but maybe you have not spent time with him and so your relationship with him is maybe not what it used to be. If that is your desire this morning, why don't you stand with me as we pray together? And maybe that could be a late New Year's resolution that we will not just believe, we will not just be believers, though we are called to believe and trust, but we need to know for ourselves. Let's pray together as we close. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful that John wrote this book and that we have been invited by him to believe through his witness, through the witness of others that walked with Jesus. And I'm so grateful that when we believe, we are actually being invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. And Lord, we have tasted Some have not yet tasted, especially the children and young people in our midst, Lord. We pray that you will work in their lives in a special way. Reveal yourself to them in a very clear and obvious way. I pray that they will know you and the beauty of your character. And we thank you, Lord, for making yourself known to us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.